Good evening, everyone. Welcome to the Korea Society, and welcome to Art and Magic, Shaman Paintings of Korea with Dr. Laurel Kendall. My name is Luce Lanzad. I'm the Program Officer for Korean Studies, and I'm so glad to see you all here tonight. It is a pleasure to introduce Dr. Laurel Kendall, the Chair of the Division of Anthropology and Curator of Asian Ethnographic Collections at the American Museum of Natural History. A scholar of popular religion and its material manifestations in East and Southeast Asia, Dr. Kendall began her long acquaintance with South Korean life in 1970 as a U.S. Peace Corps volunteer when a chance encounter with, a fem with female shamans led to her subsequent anthropological fieldwork. Her works include Shamans, Nostalgias, and the IMF, South Korean Popular Religion in Motion, Shamans, Housewives, and Other Restless Spirits, Women in Korean Ritual Life, and The Life and Hard Times of a Korean Shaman. In 2010, her Korean colleagues awarded Shaman's Nostalgias in the IMF the first Im Suk Jae Prize, recognizing a work of anthropology about Korea by a non-Korean. In 2007, she received a Lifetime Achievement Award from the International Society for Shamanic Research. Her recent work concerns the production and consumption of sacred objects in contemporary market economies, with her fieldwork in South Korea, Vietnam, Myanmar, and Bali. Please welcome Dr. Kendall. Thank you all for being here, and thank you, Korea Society. I don't ever feel like I've really brought out a book until I get to do a launch here. So it's, it's a very nice community to have. Okay, Korean shaman paintings. In Korean shaman practice, adherents encounter otherwise invisible gods in two visible forms. In the dancing, bantering, miming bodies of the shamans as they manifest the gods during elaborate rituals called kut. And in the bold, brightly colored paintings that hang on the walls of a shaman's shrine. The shaman in costume mimics the painted god. Both are intended to make a visual presence of a being that cannot otherwise be seen. For many years, I acknowledged the paintings in the shrine as a backdrop to the activities that concerned me as an ethnographer of Korean shamans. I made my own offerings, bowed to the floor in their direction, and rubbed my hands in supplication. I knew that the paintings were sacred in their way, as with all shamanic paraphernalia, that they were charged and powerful, but I did not yet give much thought to how they worked. I did not yet see a connection between gods operating through paintings hung in shrines and gods operating in and through the inspired bodies of the shamans. During my first field work in the 1970s, I did buy this painting from out of the Gladstone bag of a runner who visited the Fulbright House on a weekly basis. But I did not yet question how the painting came to be in that runner's Gladstone bag. The freeform painting that I bought had very little relationship to the paintings on the shrine walls of the shamans with whom I did field work. In those days, these were mostly cheap commercial prints or workshop reproductions. The collectors, of course, wanted the old freeform paintings. But from a shaman's perspective, cheap prints, workshop productions, improvisations on a pattern, or the work of visionaries, the paintings on the wall of the shaman's shrine are all considered animated. They are objects that have been entered by gods who assume their seats there during the shaman's initiation ritual. Around the turn of the millennium, some anthropologists, religious studies scholars, and art historians you know, across the map became interested in what we call material religion with how material things uh, from communion hosts to Buddhist temples, from amulets to altars, 
work in and through religious practice, how they help create religious experiences and understandings. There is much in the world of Korean shaman practice that involves the deployment of objects and of performing objects, using objects as ritual props to produce a space and experience at odds with the normal. Boldly colorful things, piles of offering food, theatrical weaponry, and especially the succession of red, blue, yellow, white, and green costumes the shamans wear that you saw in some of the previous slides, combines with other sensory stimuli, percussive music, incense, cups of wine, to enable the presence of a god speaking and moving in the body of a mortal woman and presiding over it all, the paintings. It seemed that I could no longer ignore them, but I wanted some allies in this investigation. I joined forces with Dr. Jung Sung Yang, a folklorist, and Professor Yul Su Yun, an art historian, both of whom have researched and written about shaman paintings. Our co-authored uh, volume was the product of these endeavors. I'm going to share a chunk of it with you firsthand. Um, I will begin this talk in a familiar space, a gallery. A gallery with a framed image hanging on a wall, such as shaman paintings have hung on the wall of this gallery. And uh, then follow the paintings in reverse motion to the less familiar space of the shaman's shrine. In other words, to consider first what collectors see in shaman paintings, and then what shamans look for in these same images to suggest some points of connection, Koreans interacting with, Koreans, with other Koreans around Korean things. Despite the obvious differences between shamans and collectors, in their intentions and interpretations. Korean collectors began to take an interest in shaman paintings only in the late 20th century. To do this, they had to stretch the definition of Korean art, uh, which, as many of you know, was originally, um, uh, you know, if you call it Korean art, you're talking about very subtle ceramics, you're talking about very subtle ink paintings, um, calligraphy, uh, things that are very refined, very elegant, very, very different from shaman paintings. It is not difficult to find a Korean art historian who considers shaman paintings garish, crude, or downright creepy and unsettling. Some of you may be thinking that yourselves, but Others avidly collect them. Aficionados had to overcome their own cultural knowledge that objects from a shaman's shrine had souls or yong attached to them, that they were unclean and potentially dangerous. Collectors came to value the paintings as they had come to value Korean folk art, as artifacts of a vanished rural life. In naive-seeming freehand drawings, they found the faces of simple and pure-hearted Koreans from another time. And this is how a collector will often describe his love or attraction to a particular painting. I saw a face like my grandmother's face. I saw the faces of our rural ancestors. Of course, many Koreans see no such thing. They are unnerved by the bold, staring faces and uh, much as participants in a kut may be unnerved by the bold stare of a shaman manifesting a god, where in normal Korean day-to-day -day encounters, eye contact is generally minimal. The shaman's face and the painted face are meant to command attention. For some, this makes the shaman paintings an arresting image, makes them work as powerful art objects. A few collectors value these same paintings as Picasso before Picasso. 
for collectors and artifacts. Yeah, one one guy told me, well, Picasso, Picasso never saw our things, but we we influenced him because our ancestors were doing it long before he was. For collectors and art aficionados, power is an abstraction, as in the power of a work of art. For shamans, power is a corporeal experience transmitted from the gods via the paintings into the shaman's own mind and body. Shamans are bonded with gods in a relationship of mutual compatibility, or habwi. The gods empower the shaman who manifests them, creates auspiciousness for her clients, and casts away misfortunes in the god's name. Through visions, dreams, bodily sensations, and intuition, the gods enable the shaman to speak and mime in the god's person and to convey their will to clients. When the gods are displeased, the shaman no longer receives a clear flow of inspiration, but experiences only their mumbling and grumbling when she prays in front of the shrine. An extremist, the gods might leave the shrine altogether, answering the shaman's supplications with stone silence. The shaman fosters a good relationship with her gods through her own daily devotions, purifications, and pilgrimages to sacred mountains to recharge her spiritual batteries, an analogy that some shamans use themselves. That's not just mine, my metaphor. Um, the paintings as seats for gods are a kind of connective media. God, shaman, and painting have a triangulated relationship. The presence of a painting in the shrine indicates the active presence of the god. A shaman's success is a measure of the god's favor. The god's favor is secured through the shaman's devotion. The paintings are not art or mere representation in this context. They are indications of presence, at least when they work as they are supposed to work. The notion of animation links the practices of the shaman's shrine to some other religious activities found in Korea and throughout the map of Asia. The ritual animation of Buddhist, Hindu, and other temple statues, and the ritual activation of religious pictures and talismans. In these traditions, in Korea, China, Japan, Tibet, Vietnam, throughout Southeast Asia, and in India, Buddhas and other deities are invited to inhabit statues following a prescribed and carefully orchestrated ritual performed by a priest or a ritual master. Korean shamans similarly call on monks or mimic in their, themselves the monkish eye-opening rituals when they install plaster Buddha images like those you see here in their own shrines. Um, but in the shaman's world, Buddhas and gods are very dissimilar entities. Buddhas, they say, are far gentler, less inclined to punish, but also gener generally less involved with human affairs. They're transcendent beings, after all. So they're less efficacious. They're less there, right there. Um, and the animation of the paintings is not the same thing as a Buddhist eye-opening of a Buddhist statue. As with other shamanic rituals, the animation of a painting lacks the certainty of a liturgical rite. It occurs within the context of an ambiguous and uncertain ritual process. Will the gods appear at all during the shaman's initiation ritual, or will the ritual fail? Most initiation rituals fail. Most gods don't make a powerful enough appearance. Will the gods be sufficiently present to take up their seats in the shrine and work harmoniously with the initiate? When an initiate fails and the gods refuse to enter the shaman's shrine, the paintings go back to the shop. 
When an initiation is ambiguous, the gods may or may not be adequately present in the shrine. The shaman may or may not be operating an efficacious practice. And if the gods are seriously displeased with the shaman, they might, having been present, they might depart. Dirty and tattered old paintings are deanimated and burnt, and the deities are invited to inhabit fresh new paintings. The collectors want the nice old paintings, but if you're a deity, you want a nice, clean, fresh one. Um, and the idea that, that a ritually acceptable, pure way to deal with a sacred thing is to burn it, that this is a clean means of disposal, means that very old paintings are particularly rare and precious to collectors. The paintings at the back of this circa 1900 stereograph were almost certainly burnt many decades ago. Collectors want old paintings, deities favor pure, clean, new things, and shamans seek the deity's good favor. But used paintings also circulate within the community of shamans, as gods are transmitted from one shaman to a successor shaman. Ideally, an aging shaman marks the end of her practice with a major ritual, hajikut, where she feasts and entertains her guardian gods for one last time and sends them off. Speaking through the mouth of the shaman, the gods indicate their desire to accompany one or another of her spirit daughters or spirit sons, the male and female shamans that she herself has initiated or mentored. Some shamans because they lack disciples or because they have ruptured relationships with their former disciples, which is also fairly common, end their practice by burying their paintings and other equipment in a secret mountain site, analogous to a mountain grave. As one shaman told me, well, we bury dead people and we do the same thing for the spirit grandmothers and grandfathers. A potential shaman tormented by the gods and driven to half-crazed wandering, might be drawn by mysterious, irresistible forces to that secret grave on the mountain, feeling things that nobody else can feel. The gods operating through the medium of the painting, even a deanimated painting, reaching out to pull the initiate to the site, and she starts furiously digging it up. And lo and behold, here is this catch of shaman stuff, including the paintings. And this is a sign of the strength of the gods and their claim on her. Now, the shamans will say, doesn't happen so often, doesn't happen so often anymore. But it does happen sometimes. There was supposedly a case just a few years ago. Um, or a potential initiate is drawn into an operable shrine. Uh, she's just wandering around in this crazy state, and she goes into a shrine and starts prostrating herself in front of the altar. And wh what this says is that the shaman who's maintaining the shrine, it's time for her to retire. Here's the successor that the gods have provided. These tales, even the most fantastic, are tales of normative transmission. The gods require shamans in order to be manifest in the world. They choose their shamans and use the tangible vehicle of paintings and paraphernalia to mark their relocation in a successor shaman's shrine. But ruptures are also common. Not all shamans make adequate provisions for their own deaths, and not all gods are, are comfortably accommodated to successors. In these circumstances, paintings, like unsettled gods, acquire a liminal and consequently problematic status. This liminality, as we shall see, also offers an aperture for the ambitions of collectors and dealers. Likewise, if a shaman dies while her shrine is still active, her paintings and other paraphernalia are charged with the agency of untended and potentially restless gods. 
Family members are often reluctant to touch, much less dispose of them. A proprietor of a shaman supply shop, a Mamulsan, um, describes a special service that he could arrange. He says, we hire, we call in a little evacuation squad, a Cholgoban, to remove these potentially dangerous objects. Others describe the rag and bone men, the social marginals, who for a fee could be prevailed upon to take these things away. These guys are so down and out, they may as well touch dangerous stuff. Um, conversations with collectors suggest that it was through this path, as ritually unclean discards matter out of place, that old shaman paintings first became items of commerce with other flotsam in flea markets, where they caught the eye of discerning collectors. Um, although it is usually acknowledged that naive foreigners, people like me, first created a market for shaman paintings as folk art. The transmission of gods to a successor shaman can also be problematic. The successor shaman might not have the capacity to work with the new gods. Um, and one of our conversation partners says, it's, it's like, think of the new shaman, the successor shaman, as a bowl being f filled with water, the gods and the gods' power. And some bowls just aren't big enough to hold everything that's being poured into them. And that doesn't work. Um, or the gods might be incompatible with gods already in the shrine. As happened when my favorite shaman conversation partner, Yong Su's mother, um, received gods and paintings from her sister, Chatterbox Munshin, uh, who retired from shamanship. The gods had told Chatterbox in a dream that they intended to go to Yong Su's mother's shrine. And Yong Su's mother, in her own dream, had seen her sister's gods walking into her own shrine. So it seemed like it was meant to be. The two shamans held a great ceremony to celebrate the, new, the gods in their new location and affix them to the wall. Now, Yong Su's mother had a small, narrow shrine. So to fit all of the gods, she put her sister's deities under her own. You know, here's, here's her sister's primary guardian, and here's her own primary guardian on top, on the wall. Um, but when Yongsu's mother invoked and petitioned the gods in her shrine, all she heard was mumbling and grumbling. Not the clear flow of inspiration that her own gods had previously been sending her. Her business was bad, her health was bad, and she began to have troubling dreams. Now, um, in one dream, some women came to her house for a divination, and she sat down behind her divination tray, a tray like the, tree, the tray you see in the painting. She began to cast coins and grains of rice, assisted by her great spirit grandmother, the deity like the deity pictured in the painting. Um, three women had come for a divination. One woman sat down in front of the tray. She invited the other two women to sit, but counter to her understandings of etiquette, they refused. They hovered over on the side, standing, and she felt uncomfortable. And she began to cast the grains and make begin to look for visions. And then suddenly, one of these standing women clumped over, grabbed the tray, and spilled the rice on the floor. And she woke up, feeling really bad on account of her great spirit grandmother. She said it was grandmother's rice that was spilled on the floor. So assuming something was up, she went right into her shrine room. And lo and behold, her great spirit grandmother and her sister's Jade Immortal, her primary deity, the gods that had been put together, were on the floor, stuck together. They had been fighting, she said. So this arrangement was not going to work. She deanimated her sister's paintings, but because her sister was so attached to them, she didn't burn them. She rolled them up and put them under the altar. Now, inactive paintings of ambiguous status 
stowed under an altar are one kind of painting that might be brought out when runners come around saying, hey, lady, you got any old paintings you're not using anymore? Uh, but Chatterbox's pictures would not have been candidates for the art market. They were 1970s commercial prints, and no collector really would have wanted them. But they were powerful, as the story indicates. Uh, the interest of Korean collectors, museums, and dealers intersected them with several possible trajectories. The paintings in an uh, um, abandoned shrine that needed to be removed, the old and tattered painting that would be burned and replaced, and the inactive paintings rolled up under an altar. When the popularity of shaman paintings peaked in the 1980s and 1990s, dealers actively sought out shamans and tried to acquire old paintings from their shrines. Here is one story from the moment of collecting. Mr. K, a dealer, and Professor P, a scholar, worked together in the 1980s to make a large collection of shaman paintings for a new museum. They went to shops in provincial cities to, and put out the word to runners, but they also cultivated their own relationships with shamans. Their reminiscences are instructive. Mr. K told me, it was because we were making a museum. We asked them if they couldn't compromise a bit. Um, they would tell us they had to replace the paintings. It would be expensive. When we thought they would concede, we would offer some money. How much? We would bargain a little. Professor P says, we had to go through formalities. We set down money and made prostrations. And he pantomimes not handing over a payment, but setting it down on a low offering tray and bowing. He bobs a bow, and he laughs at the memory. I ask, but didn't the paintings carry an inauspicious humor if they were removed? And Mr. K says, that's why we always set down an offering and petitioned with utmost sincerity. They couldn't just give them away without the god's consent. They had to do some sort of ritual so that nothing bad would happen when the painting went out. We couldn't just take them. They would set down our money and kowtow and tell us to kowtow, and then they would wave their five-colored divination flags. Oops. Yes. If you pulled out a red one from the bundle of flags, they would say, well done, that's good. So I can't resist asking. I say, what if you pulled out an inauspicious yellow flag? Mr. K says, well, that was just our tough luck. Isn't this good data we're giving you, he said. Although Mr. K speaks of bargaining, the encounter is far from a straightforward market transaction. The god's consent is sought through ritual means, even as the gods can indicate their willingness or unwillingness to inhabit a shrine and work with a particular shaman. The cash itself is not presented as a market transaction, but as part of a ritualized offering. Mr. K and Professor P were not unusual. Other collectors have cultivated relationships with shamans, eventually making small offerings to acquire paintings that would otherwise be destroyed. By now, some of you may be wondering, um, who did the paintings? And are these paintings still being produced? That is a bit of a story. In the tradition of shamans from Honghae province, uh, the northwest of what is now North Korea, but active around Incheon and around Seoul today, painters come from families that have very close ties to the shaman world. Sometimes they have a mother or a wife who is a shaman. And the painter is seen as being in some way bonded to the gods uh, himself. A very few such painters are still active. Some shamans and two traditionalist painters that I was able to locate and interview 
underscored the importance of the initial consultation between the shaman and the painter who imagines the deity in his own mind and in the belief that the image must exactly match the shaman's vision for the god to enter the painting. Ha, that's me, I can live there, and work with the shaman. An Zhong Mo is probably the best known living painter of shaman paintings in Korea today. His mother was a shaman herself, and his father made paper flowers and other decorations for shaman rituals. Established shamans in the Huanghe tradition are proud to use Mr. An's paintings and those attributed to his father. It was a mark of distinction and in their eyes, a sign of good practice. A painter praised the work of this family, saying that these paintings induced efficacious initiations, that the gods came out 60% of the time. Now, a 60% success rate for shaman initiations is a very high rate. Mr. An claims an uncanny ability to reproduce what the shamans describe to him. Once, when he was painting a shaman's teacher who had died and become a god, a shaman he had never met in life, a little bit of ink dropped off his brush and fell on the face of the painting. And then the client arrived and she looked at the painting and she said, how did you know there was a mole on my teacher's face in exactly that spot? And so he, his wife says, so you see, you see, you can't say that person has no influence from the spirits. He's got something special going for him. This is one of Mr. An's paintings. The white horse and white robe carefully matched to tradition and to the commissioning shaman's vision. Soul shamans commissioned paintings from monk painters called uh, goldfish monks, Gumo Sunim, who also painted for temples well into the 20th century. The shaman would offer a sack of rice. The painter would bathe and then pray, using the rice as an offering before beginning to work on the painting. I met one contemporary painter, I will call him Kim Hwabek, who, while not a monk, considers himself a part of this line. He bathes, he avoids polluting activity while he's working on the commission, and he prays before undertaking a commission, and then prays to report to the deities that the commission is complete. He does the same thing when he paints a Buddhist temple painting. Although he does not lack for business, he believes that this kind of painting, expensive to execute, is a dying art. In the 1970s, um, the market in shaman paintings came to be dominated by commercial workshop painters, rather than monks or solitary painters like Kim Hwa Baek and Mr. An. This meant several things. These new workshop painters were trained commercial artists, cartoonists or painters of signs and lurid movie house facades. As artists who make their living by their brushes, they are not visionaries attempting to give shape in their mind's eye to gods already glimpsed by the shaman client. Instead, they work from patterns and copy from photographs and books including illustrated scholarly publications about shaman paintings, and they do their work without attention to religious taboos and purifications. You can't, oops. You can see the difference. This one, the closer one, oh, I have a little, yes, this one. This is more of a freeform old painting this one you see all over the place. It's based on a pattern and it's much more standardized. In fact, you can see how it was produced. These are rare surviving. There was a huge, uh, my co-author Yun Yo Su acquired from a runner, a huge bundle of semi-complete paintings that give some idea of how they were produced in the workshop. Um, 
with the face, the important face, just as in carving a Buddha statue, the face is left to last and probably left to the master. Um, Well-trained workshop painters can produce much, uh, reproduce much requested images like this one from memory without the aid of a pattern. And new paintings have become much more standardized than they were in the past. Some shamans commission paintings directly from painters, but most painter, painting resembles the production of an infinitely reproducible commodity rather than the old interaction between an, a shaman and a painter that is intended to translate personal vision into a painted image of a god. Most shamans now purchase their paintings directly from the shaman supply shops, or manmulsang, which sell costumes, fans, incense burners, and other paraphernalia. The shops used to cluster near the country bus terminus on Chongno Oga, but are now scattered through the landscape, like supermarkets, one proprietor told me. Many of the proprietors of these shops regard their work as just another business, but some claim a connection to the gods and the shaman world, which they claim causes them to be honest in their business because if they are dishonest, the gods who give them business will punish them. For many Munchen, probably most, the Sang proprietor acts as an intermediary when the shaman commissions a painting, taking the shaman's order and transmitting it to the workshop. In other words, and with few exceptions, the act of acquiring a painting has become a commercial transaction, a procedure far removed from the country shaman's visit to the monk bearing a sack of rice for her offering. The proprietor of a shaman supply shop described his paintings to Martin Pedersen, a, a Danish anthropologist, as just commodities until the shaman herself calls the deities into them in her shrine. Many shamans, and certainly most of those who have hung colored prints and even photographs in their shrines, would agree, and most would probably maintain, that the shaman's own visionary capacity is more significant than the painting itself. If the gods favor the shaman, they will want to be in the shrine. If they're somewhat ambivalent about the particular shaman, they're not going to go into the painting and help her have a successful practice. But some of our conversation partners did insist that only the work of a careful painter who had observed all precautions and poured his soul into the work would be pleasing to the gods and consequently efficacious. These are shamans who can afford that kind of painting. According to one shaman who claimed that she would only buy paintings whose beauty implied that the painter had put his whole heart and soul into the task, she said, Mr. On produces paintings that souls that young enter, that gods enter. Art students and commercial painters may be less expensive, but you can't really say that gods have gone into their paintings and they are nothing more than ordinary paintings. Another shaman told us that even if she orders through the shops, she insists that the painter have some sort of spiritual connection and that she can sense when she views the completed paintings whether or not they will be an effective medium for the gods. The Manmulsang proprietor is a critical intermediary. One proprietor claimed that it takes a special energy, a, a key, um, a ch like Chinese qi. You have to have a particular key for this work um, to make sure that the uh, commissioned painting matches not just a well-known type, such as a mountain god or general, but the correct subcategory indicated uh, by minor variations in the shaman's vision. Was the tiger that the initiate saw with the mountain god a yellow tiger or a white tiger or something else? Was the general's arm raised or lowered? They don't just paint them the way they are here in the sample book, he said. You see the sample book. If the god appeared in an ice blue robe, then it has to be an ice blue robe, right? If the god appeared wearing a white vest, then it has to be painted that way. And if it was a floral pattern, then it should be painted that way. 
There have been further changes in the new millennium, as South Korean workshop painters are now being outpriced by Korean Chinese living in the Korean Autonomous Region of the People's Republic of China. The newcomers have received conservatory training and produce impressive reproductions of Buddhist-inflected painting. But if the products are more, uh, more skillfully executed than the workshop paintings, far less expensive, connoisseurs find them even less appealing. The grandfathers no longer have Korean faces. Painter Kim Hwa Beck remarked about the gods portrayed in these new shaman paintings. He feels that many of these cheap works have been painted over printed reproductions, sort of a paint by number, such that they are all alike, and in that sense, not the real paintings that enable shamans to effectively connect with their gods. Even so, it is difficult for Korean painters to compete with these products. In 2009, one shop proprietor related that of the three Korean workshop painters with whom he still maintains contact, one had started driving a cab to make ends meet. So, concluding thoughts. Shamans engage in a living practice, and they continue to install paintings in their shrines. Those shamans who do hold old paintings are aver aware of the value of what they have, even as they are courted by scholars, collectors, and museum curators. Through these paintings, uh, they have, uh, well, through these conversations with dealers, collectors, curators, they have come to think of the paintings as they have come to think of their own practice through a language of heritage and heritage preservation. I want to leave you with a story from this new world of collector-shaman interactions. A venerable old shaman and her students performed a kut in a small private museum. The director, who had collected shaman paintings since the 1960s, fell in love with one of her paintings. He was one of the guys who really sees them as Picasso before Picasso. And this painting, particular painting, he thought was very Picasso-like. He says, but she couldn't bear to give it up, but she gave me one almost as nice, that, and he hung that painting in his museum. Well, through his uh, kind introduction, I was able to meet and interview the shaman, and she told a slightly different story. She said she performed two kut on different occasions at his museum, and through her shamanic vision, she could tell that many people had died bad deaths in that site, it, you know, during battles in the Korean War, perhaps. And she, she liked the director. She wanted to protect him. She, wanted, she had good feelings about the museum. She wanted to protect the museum. So she sort of summoned her array of gods and decided that a particular general he, he agreed to stay in the museum. So, yeah, this wasn't a case of, uh, this is my second best painting, so you can have it. She sent the general to the museum because he had work to do there. Thank you. We have a few copies of uh, Dr. Kendall's book still available for purchase, as well as drinks and refreshments. Please enjoy.